Hello, everyone. Thank you for checking out this special episode of Really Dicey. This is Manny, and I am here with... Uh, hi, I'm Scott Dorwood. Uh, I'm a writer and podcaster. Uh, I record with these two retrobates, Matt and Paul, as the good friends of Jackson Elias, and we uh, have also done this book together, which we're here to talk about. And I'm Paul Fricker, as Scott said. I'm... Um... We podcast together under the good friends Jackson Elias, and I write for Call of Cthulhu. I worked with Mike on uh, seventh edition Call of Cthulhu and developed this book with Scott and Matt. Uh, I'm Mike Mason. I'm the creative director for Call of Cthulhu at Chaosium. So I tend to uh, look after all the Call of Cthulhu lines, and this being one of the books in the line, I've helped to kind of shepherd the original edition and now this new second edition of the book. And I'm Matt Sanderson. So the uh, the third part of the trio of the good friends of Jackson Elias, and also a freelance writer who's written for a fair few books for Call of Cthulhu now as well. Mm. And today we're going to talk about nameless horrors. Um, and I'm excited to talk to all of you because um, this is the what's in March. This will be coming out uh, 2023, and all of you have worked on the previous version that came out about what seven years ago, I would say. Um, mm. So that that's that's really fantastic. What exactly is this book? Chaosium has put out fantastic adventures. Uh, what exactly is the theme for this book exactly? The idea of it was that we're all very experienced Call of Cthulhu players. Uh, Paul and I have been playing Call of Cthulhu since the 80s and Matt, not quite as long, but still for a fair old time. And we've played a lot of published material. We've written a lot of our own stuff. And one thing that we wanted to at least play with was the idea of trying to introduce new elements into the mythos. That there's quite often this this tendency, if you're writing a Call of Cthulhu scenario, to look through the existing monsters and gods and so on and sort of think oh yeah i can write a scenario based around this but we wanted to give ourselves the creative constraint for this book of not using anything from the existing canon uh, the other constraint we gave ourselves was that there would be no expectation that the solution to the uh, the problems and the scenarios would be violence that you, know, you can in a lot of cases go for the classic call of cthulhu tommy guns and dynamite and fire solutions but at the same time there's you know these are designed to be very adaptable to however the players decide to approach them and these are six scenarios that bridge quite a lot of the different uh, periods of Call of Cthulhu. So it goes from, I think I'm right, Matt, you're one, you've are one. you got one in Gaslight, haven't you? Uh, two Gaslight ones. They're both Gaslight. Yeah. Okay. And then we go uh, into the 20s, I think 30s as well, mm -hmm. as well as modern day. Um, and everything you need is there ready to play because they come with... Um, uh, characters that you can download, investigators that you can download from Chaosium uh, and all the handouts and so on so they're kind of, uh, you know, they're very much like ready to run. I'm really intrigued about the, the themes of this book. What is everyone's philosophy when it comes to horror then? Do you feel that um, sometimes updates have to be made for your games or, or do you feel that maybe game masters need uh, more tools for horror? Uh, what, what's everyone's thoughts concerning this book? Call of Cthulhu is a very kind of broad church in terms of what makes a good scenario and many different things can make many different good scenarios uh, and often you know Scott alluded to earlier uh, often Call of Cthulhu historically has been you know a bit of a creature feature in some cases some some scenarios are very much built around the monster and uh, you know trying to tackle you know the monster's kind of um, you know appearance in in you know the investigations investigators world uh, other the times, you know, there's no monsters in the Call of Cthulhu scenario. It could be a could be the effects of strange magics or dimensions and 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 so on, or even just down to kind of human on the human level in terms of you know uh, bad guys in terms of you know human cultists who are doing bad things that the investigators have to stop. So it, it just have a, it's a broad church in terms of what makes a scenario in terms of what you know what the antagonists are in a scenario. Uh, but I you know it wouldn't be Call of Cthulhu without Cthulhu. So 
monsters obviously do play a, a key role often. Um, and um, what I think this book brings is to kind of exemplify, and it kind of almost, um, it, it well, it, it preempted the, the new edition of Malleus Monsters, because obviously the original version of this book came out, you know, some years ago, uh, and it kind of showed that you you don't need to use, you know, the, the, the run-of-the-mill monsters all the time. You can actually just do something new. Obviously, when Malleus came out, you know, a, a couple of years back, there's a lot of kind of material in there to help people kind of, you know, advice in terms of if you want to design your own monster, here's how you could do it. Um, and so it's kind of almost like full circle and saying, well, here's, here's some that these guys made, you know, they, they, you know, they took the kind of the tools that were there in terms of what is the mythos and, and what, you know, what monsters kind of work well in a scenario. And I think what's interesting in this book is the, the range of monsters, effectively, the range of kind of antagonists in this is very broad. It's not just, they're not all kind of tentacle horrors lying in the, lying in the cellar. There are very different kind of um, monsters, you know, using that broad term. Um, and probably best for me to show up and let the guys um, speak about you know their own kind of creations in that way. So I don't know, Matt. Do you want to? As you you have the the oldest scenarios in the book in terms of chrono chronologically, you know, doing the kind of the two gaslight ones. Your your uh, monsters are quite different in the sense that it might be worth you leading up, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I tried to think going back to one of the core. Uh, focuses that we had when we were discussing okay what what should the creatures or monsters in this not be and as scott alluded to they can't be things that are saved by or destroyed by my favorite and every investigator's best friend dynamite <laughs> so you can't blow it up you have to have some other way to solve this thing so i tried to think of more abstract problems um my first scenario, um, an amaranthine desire was born out of the idea of well what if a place is odd so there's something malevolent about that it's not you can't in gaslight here it's not exactly you can drop a h-bomb on it but it's something that's a bit too big for you to deal with and then in message of art the second one the uh, one set in uh, gaslight paris what if it's something very more like a concept that is completely abstract and it's almost going back to that adage of well how do you kill you can't kill an idea and uh, riffing on some quite um, concepts that I've uh, got inspired by the works of Nigel Neal that thought about, well, what if this particular thing that sets humanity apart from the rest of the mythos is actually some something alien in its own right and just expanded upon it from there? So in my two scenarios, the one I've got in the 20s is very much um, a kind of small town. I mean, I've, I've said small town America in the book. Uh, but it could be a small town anywhere, I guess. Um, and it kind of kicks off somewhat in media res. It's just a, a town where strange things start to happen. And it's, see, it, it's got a very kind of Twilight Zone inspired um, feel, I, I hope, is, is kind of the, yeah, the goal I was going for. Um, and yes, yeah, it's, it's about a town where people begin behaving strangely and obviously there's a reason for that and the characters are members of the town you know they're townspeople and they've got relationships with many of the npcs and that's quite important uh, in this scenario that you'd, i think this scenario particularly for me it's it's the, the investigators are you know the pre-generated investigators are quite important in this one um, and their relationships with the various townspeople, and that kind of draws them in. I don't often start with a monster. I mean, you were asking about monsters and so on. I don't, I don't often start with a monster. It's often I sort of start with a situation, and then sometimes just stick a monster on, you know, not, not stick it on, but, you know, to kind of think, well, how does that manifest? And, you know, if this is going to be called a clue, it could be any monster, it could be any anything, and and... I, I look at the what's in Call of Cthulhu and perhaps bring something in from that. Uh, but here, obviously, we're talking about nameless horrors. So it's really um, in this scenario, this is uh, I'm talking about um, and some fell on stony ground. It's really an influence that comes in as an influence. Something is influencing the townspeople to behave in this strange way. In the modern day one, it's very much more and it's called Moonchild. Um, it's very much more a domestic situation, uh, a domestic situation gone 
badly wrong but it starts off quite mundanely and and the 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 kicker for it is really i think this time is past now but there was a time probably well when i wrote it say 10 years ago when people were coming out of the woodwork and saying oh hi you know i used to be a you know do you remember me we were at school together or we were at college together um and i don't think people do that so much now because people have already made those connections or you're growing up with a bunch of people and they're already on social media but there was that time when people were reaching out so you get in a group of people who didn't have a shared recent history but they had a shared distant history from say 20 years before and they've been out of touch for all that time and now one of them is reaching out to their old friends and bringing them all back together in a cafe to meet them and explain their uh, dire situation to them and that and they want some help uh, and this help you know which hopefully the investigators are, are willing to give brings them into contact with this strange domestic situation and then that kind of escalates into uh into the rest of the moon child scenario yeah with my two scenarios they both share a bit of a theme in that one thing that fascinates me about the mythos one thing that i think sets it apart from a lot of other horror settings is that the entities of the mythos aren't necessarily what we consider to be evil that they're more neutral things, or at least things that exist outside human concepts of morality. But where you get humans who interact with them and perhaps find ways to draw upon their power, that's where the potential for evil or malevolence really comes in. And with the first scenario, Bleak Prospect, I, I also wanted to explore the idea of social isolation because I think isolation is really important in horror and most of the time it's physical isolation. But here the player characters are all people living in a shantytown in a Hooverville during the Great Depression and are cut off from the larger community by poverty and by social stigmatization. And I wanted to put them in a horrible situation where they were perhaps being preyed upon by more powerful forces and were unable to call upon the larger community for help, which I think is probably the very essence of horror. And, um, yeah, I mean, it, they, there are a lot of monsters in it, don't get me wrong, but the monsters to me weren't the the scary part, or at least not initially. And similarly with uh, the second scenario, the space between, um, again, I, I sort of wanted to play with stuff there. And the, the player characters this time are all members of a church, which some outsiders might consider to be a cult, who are very heavily involved in the film industry in Hollywood and who uh, find themselves having to do progressively perhaps more and more unpleasant thing to try things to try to save the film production that they're on. And, it, you know, it almost becomes, as far as I'm concerned, a bit like the Milgram experiment as to, you know, how far you can push the player characters in this before they think, oh, hang on, are we the bad guys? So is this book similar to... Um... The, the Matches book that came out a few years ago and the uh, the Harvest book that came out last year in the sense that these are all separate adventures. You can connect them if you wish. Uh, there are options for that, but these are all separate adventures in different locations, different times. Yeah, they're very much, they are very much separate scenarios in, in terms of being standalone. They are, they are, they are in, in a sense, they, they probably work best as, as one shots and, and each scenario comes with its own set of pre-generated investigators and that kind of hardwired into the scenario to some degree some some more more so with certain scenarios um it, it would be possible to kind of you know bring your existing group of investigators to the scenarios potentially but would require a bit more work and they wouldn't be so hardwired into the into the kind of the motivations behind the scenario. So that they do work very well as, as kind of one shots in that sense. Um, but certainly um, the, the, the main reason why they wouldn't work well as a, well, don't work very easily as a campaign because they are set across 
different time periods. So uh, there are two set in the kind of eight, eight, late 1800s, two then set in the kind of 1920s, 30s, and two in modern day. So in technically, there's no reason why if you didn't, if you wanted to, you couldn't kind of sub connect them. So the two 1800s, in theory, you could find a way to work them together. The two kind of in the 1920s and 30s and the the modern day theoretically you could but there's but they don't they're not really intended to work in that in the, in that way they are very much um you know your your play for this evening for a number of evenings uh and then 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 move on to a, a different scenario kind of thing personally i i think one shots like that are quite underrated as a gaming experience people I think naturally gravitate towards campaigns and you know want to have characters go through multiple scenarios but I think that there's something potentially more intense about a good one shot in that you are perhaps playing with characters who you're not so convinced they're going to survive the experience or at least get out of it without some kind of hideous long-term consequences and I think that gives everyone permission to treat it more as a horror movie, that instead of it feeling like an ongoing episodic TV program or a serial or something like that, here you do have this thing of, you know, is anyone going to get out of this alive? Let's play and see what happens. So uh, so for anyone that has uh, purchased and looked at the previous um uh the the uh, the older version of the nameless horrors uh what are some of the the big changes that you that you've done to these stories and it looks like these are the exact same stories from the the uh, uh from the previous book that, that's right i mean mainly um it was a kind of unfortunate kind of situation of timing with the original version um it came out um what you might want to loosely term as the older version of Chaosium. Uh, and so it came out as a softback, um, single colour, black and white, um, you know, book. Um, and literally, you know, just a few months later, the kind of the new version of Chaosium kind of arrived uh, and all of our kind of Call of Duty books then were coming out as predominantly hardbacks, uh, colour, um and you know with more kind of investment in the art and the the layout and the uh the maps and so on and this book unfortunately kind of fell between the two and so um it was always a desire from 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 my part to kind of to give it the kind of the the upgraded you know version as it were that we've done with everything subsequently so it was a chance to come back and revisit the book um and so in a sense, the, the, the difference is, is that the scenarios are the same. They are the same scenarios. The difference is um, it's now par back. It's full colour. All of the art has been redone. Uh, all of the maps and player handouts have been redone. And uh, as a consequence of having the opportunity to obviously to put out the second edition, um, we were able to, you know, myself and, and the authors were able to kind of review the text uh, correct a few still you know typos and a few things that we haven't quite got right the first time uh and so on and just um basically you know um give the text a, a bit of a finesse where where possible um but effectively it's you know the same you know great scenarios but just presented in a more attractive and and um uh useful way in a sense with a lot more uh additional material that we now provide with cares in books so along with the book you get the you know you get the map packs for the players you get the map packs for the keeper and the handouts you get the the npc artwork as a series of you know um pdfs so if you are playing with vtts or printing them out at the table you've got those um npc art and things like that you can now use it people tend to make more use of these days um so all of that is now included which wasn't really part of the old book in that sense so it's uh, kind of a bit more bells and whistles i guess is a way to to look at it uh, and, and to the writers, uh, and I and I apologize in advance because this is really an unfair question. Um, uh, without spoiling your stories, um, is there anything? I mean, as as someone who's written a few things myself here and there, I always, no matter how much praise you get, I always look at my stories as imperfect, no matter what. <laughs> and uh, I and I, for I hear other writers feel the same way sometimes. So now that you had a chance to kind of look back at your stories and 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 uh, and rewrite them in a sense, or at least certain parts. Uh, was there any, what can you share when it came to do the changes that you made without spoiling it? If, unless you wish to spoil it. Um, I mean, personally, I 
didn't really change any of the content. The, the, the only significant change, I think, to either of mine was just a correction that there were some missing stat blocks from the original version that we fixed in this new one. But fundamentally, it's, it's exactly the same text. Yeah, I mean, it was interesting looking back at these scenarios. I mean, although they're only written like, well, published seven years ago, it's kind of written eight, nine, ten years ago. Um, it's hard to put my finger on what, but I, I kind of feel like the scenarios that I write now are a little different. Um, just, mm -hmm. I guess, as a gamer, you don't usually freeze what you, if you know, unless you're publishing it, what you're, what you were doing ten years ago or twenty years ago doesn't get frozen in time for you to be able to look at it again you know in the in the present day um so it's interesting to look at these scenarios and yeah i just feel oh yeah i, I enjoy these scenarios they're a little different to like I say what i might do now and um i'm not quite sure if i can express how um but yeah as, as scott said we didn't and mike said we didn't change a great deal it's really going through it and seeing um if there are any little errors or um anything that can just be you know made clearer in the wording and so on uh so it's just a, a polish um a polish up really yeah 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 kind of echoing what the others have said there wasn't any major a major changes but it was certainly a a trip down memory lane seeing how we did things uh, a good few years ago compared to how i do it now yeah. Are you able to say what the difference is, Matt? Because I, I, I kind of struggle with that. But, you know, you, like you said, it's a, a little bit of a trip down memory lane. Do you, do you think you'd, if you were writing them now, do you think you'd write them differently? I probably would have maybe structured them slightly differently, but the content would I essentially be the same. Yeah. But yeah, maybe some of the structure would be slightly different. And maybe some of the wording would be uh, slightly different. But otherwise, it's the, the core of the idea is what makes it those scenarios. Yeah, mm -hmm. totally. Yeah. Yeah. I, think, I mean, I stand by them. I think, um, yeah, they, uh, I'm very pleased with them. Yeah. I think yeah, the other thing to add that we don't often say is that these have stood the test of time. You know, they've been out there mm. in the world for seven years, um, you know, with the original edition. And obviously, people have played them and read them and so on. Um, and um, you know, often, you know, when we, you know, any game publisher puts books out, obviously, there's reviews and, and people, emailing in about things we got wrong or things or things they liked and so on and um and these these have consistently been very popular scenarios you know often you know uh you, you look on forums and people asking for scenario recommendations often you know one of the you know they're you know they're, they're traveling around for a gaslight era scenario or a modern day one of you know one of these will pop up and and you know likewise 1920s and so on the names will pop up every now and again so Clearly, there's a there's a, a popularity to them, and um, so it's it's nice to be able to kind of you know give them a new coat of paint, effectively, but put out what are mm. already very strong scenarios uh, and put them back out into the world, especially at this point where we have a you know um, more and more people playing Call of Cthulhu every year mm. um, who you know weren't around seven years ago playing Call of Cthulhu are coming to these fresh and as, as new players. So it's nice to be able to. Uh, to put these in back into their hands effectively and i think as well one of the things that's kept them current is the fact that they've seen quite a lot of play on um on youtube and on actual play podcasts uh i, I was delighted to see for example the glass cannon network running bleak prospect a little while back as their introduction to call of cthulhu mm. uh, and that that was a fantastic playthrough mm. but likewise i think it was uh josephine mcadam ran uh, message of art for the calyx uh group that um good time society uh brought together um and she she did quite a lot of work around the uh the production of it as well that she she researched the group involved with the scenario one of their members was a musician and herself knowing how to play the piano played some of the um some of the tunes that that uh, musician had written to <laughs> accompany the playthrough as background music and thought wow th this is dedication that even i don't go to when i when i run this stuff <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah it's great seeing people run things that that you know you've written and you know when they do that it's like oh wow this is uh this is this is more elaborate than, than when i ran it yeah it's great it's great what people do with the the scenarios 
uh, what about the art? It would, now that um, it looks now uh, over 200 pages and there's uh, every, even the design itself, is, which I, I love the design of the Call of Cthulhu books. And now that that's, this book has now adapted to that design, what, did you have any input on the art whatsoever? Anything new or um, anything like that? We, we approached, uh, um, well, six new artists, effectively. Some some artists we worked with um, for a long time in, on Call of Cthulhu, people like Pat LeBoyko. Um, but um, but uh, we also wanted to try and bring in, you know, work with some newer artists as well. So uh, there's Celine De uh, Davis, Emmanuel Desiati, Irene uh, Kano, Lee Simpson and Nicholas Gray, who are relatively one might say newcomers to Call of Cthulhu. They have done a bit of work and and some of them, uh, some of their some of them some of their art features in the Cults of Cthulhu book. But um, this was uh, what we wanted to do was kind of give each one one scenario so they could really kind of get into the the kind of the, the flesh of the scenario and, and produce it. And obviously they're quite different art styles, being you know six different artists. And so um, you know art it's a very subjective thing, <laughs> and some people prefer certain styles more than others. So it is a mix. Um, which, in a sense, I, I kind of like because the, the the book is a mix of scenarios. Mm. It's a, you know, they're very different scenarios uh, from three very different authors. So the art kind of underpins that to some degree as well by presenting, you know, quite different art styles across the scenarios. But hopefully, captures you know uh, the 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 you know the heart of the scenario in, in the art as well. But that's um, you know, art is a an interesting process. It's always you're never quite sure what you're going to get back. You hope, you know, you hope to uh, to see what you want to see, and, and you know, you normally do. So it's it's uh, some really interesting art in this book as well. Hmm. Yeah. And, and if I, I, oh, I, I love, the, oh sorry, I was just going to say I love the artwork in the new book, but I also, yeah, I, I mean, it's you know, we, we've you know, you've obviously updated the art for the color layout and so on but i still also have a real soft spot for the the original artwork the the cover and the interior artwork and the the previous edition as well um you know i i i think it's probably worth pointing out that you know the the update isn't because that artwork was bad in any way i no. john white did a fantastic job with the internal artwork but it is black and white so it doesn't fit the new layout and there's also that kind of thing, Call of Cthulhu being a game that's over 40 years old, you know, um, and a game that is backwards compatible. Um, it, it, people, you know, pick up older versions of the books all the time and still use them. So I think, you know, having, you know, the older version still stands on its own two feet is a very, you know, very uh, attractive in that way. Um, and this doesn't diminish that. It, it just adds to it effectively. Well, excellent. Um, thank you for sharing all this. Um, is there anything I haven't asked you about concerning this book that you wanted to share? Um, it's really good. <laughs> uh, as, as I sort of mentioned in passing, if people are interested in hearing any of the scenarios played, uh, I know Matt and I, for example, have run a, a fair few of them on different actual play podcasts. Matt with Into the Darkness and me with uh, Ain't Slate Nobody and How We Roll and oh and pretending to be people as well. I, I ran uh, Bleak Prospect for them. Uh, so yeah, I mean, there's plenty of opportunities if you want to try before you buy or you know even just hear how we run our own stuff. Yeah, I think that's a really good valid point because um, often today with the ease of you know watching people. Or listening to them, you know, playing these scenarios, you know, any scenarios is a it's a great way to not only just enjoy listening to somebody playing the scenario, but obviously if you're intended to run it yourself, getting to see another group how they how they tackled it, the kind of things that they did to kind of you know did they go off script in terms of you know what the scenario was you know and how another group and you know, keeper handles it, it's all good kind of you know background material to kind of make a few notes from. So it's. Um, the fact that these scenarios are already out there in the world, in that sense, there's, as Scott says, there's a there's a kind of a a wealth of kind of pre-existing plays uh, to to draw upon and take inspiration from. So that's that's you know that's a that's a bonus really in a, in a sense, isn't it? And I think anybody who's considering getting the book, I think it's it's worth bearing in mind that you're getting like six ready to run scenarios with you know, 
everything you need to, to run them is, is like there, including the, the investigator sheets and handouts and everything. And also, it's going to give you the opportunity to dip your toe into different time periods with Call of Cthulhu. You know, there's Gaslight, there's 20s, there's modern day. So um, w without the commitment of, of launching in and running a whole campaign in that period, you can just you know, run a one shot in those different periods. And there's support in the text you know, to enable you to do that. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think that's another feature. And hopefully, I think on a on a personal level as well, I hope it inspires other people to say that they're not constrained by just the monsters in the core book or the Malice mm. Monstorum. They can create their own things because the mythos is wider than just what's presented in those pages. It's an infinitely vast and horrible place. And by all means, add to it. Create more horror. <laughs> so um, anyone that enjoys these adventures and want to follow more of your works... Um, where, where, what else have you written in uh, for Call of Cthulhu or for any RPG um, that you would recommend? Well, the three of us collaborated uh, on a pulp Cthulhu campaign called The Two-Headed Serpent, which we co-wrote between the three of us, which came out a few years back, um, which has been, I think, fairly well received. Um, both Again, both Matt and I have run that for different actual play podcasts. Uh, so if you want to listen to that, you can you can do so. Um, and we obviously do the podcast together. We do a fanzine that ties in with the podcast for our Patreon backers that we put out every six months that includes Call of Cthulhu scenarios licensed by Chaosium. And so, you know, we collaborate on that on a pretty much an ongoing basis. And you can see... Um... All three of these chaps work across uh, a lot of the Call of Cthulhu line. I mean, Scott's got a scenario in the Keeper's Screen Pack, the uh, mm -hmm. uh, Blackwater Creek. Um, yeah. And Matt's got a scenario in the actual Call Keeper rulebook for 7th edition amidst these ancient trees. And Paul obviously co-wrote the 7th edition with me. So uh, there's a lot of Paul's work in the, in throughout the books as well. Um, and, um, and as Scott said, Tyranny's Serpent particularly. And also... Um, Paul and Scott both um, contributed to the new edition of Masks of Nathotep as well, the, the big kind of campaign for Call of Cthulhu. Um, so their, their fingerprints are in that. And just just thinking not to leave Matt out again is the, the um, Deadlight, another, um, I can't think of the full name of the book, another Dark Turns, uh, Matt's scenario, the Saturnine Chalice, um, is in that uh, kind of duo companion book uh, and again is uh, has been very well received so um there's plenty of other work from these chaps uh out out in the world already to uh, to go and look up if you uh, you know if you enjoy what you find in nameless horrors or you've enjoyed what playing what they've uh, written already then nameless horrors is obviously something to to look at as well hmm. all right uh excellent um, again this will be out in march 2023 nameless horrors six scenarios um, we'll put a link once it's available in the description below. Um, so one last question to, to end this off, uh, a fun question, I hope. Um, what is currently your favorite either horror movie or horror book that you're enjoying right now? Okay, well, I'll jump in. Uh, <laughs> in fact, we've got a forthcoming episode. Uh, the, the film I've enjoyed most this year is probably Barbarian, uh, and we've got an um, episode coming up on that uh, I'm not sure when that comes out. I think probably in March. Um, so yeah, where we discuss that one. Oh, when you say discussing, are you talking about your podcast or? Yeah, sorry, on on our podcast. Yeah, the one uh, Good Friends Jackson Elias that Scott, Matt, and I produce. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, book wise, um, I, I've recently started reading some of T. Kingfish's horror novels. Uh, I've only read two of them so far, but she's done this kind of weird I uh, sort of thematic cycle where she takes classic weird tales and then does sort of want reimaginings of them. And she's done this with Arthur Macon's The White People and uh Pose the Fall of the House of Usher and uh, Blackwood's uh The Willows. And yeah, what I've read of her stuff so far is yeah, it's it's imaginative, it's weird and it's very, very different from the source material. Like, I, I think I rather like it. 
I was going to just throw in that I've uh, I've just finished. Um, it's actually a reread of a book I read many, many, many years ago. Uh, a bit of a classic, uh, Ray Bradbury's "Something Wicked This Way Comes." Oh yeah, uh, which uh, if uh, haven't read, I do recommend as a classic Bradbury book. Rabbit in headlights from me. I haven't been able to read or watch <laughs> anything for a long time because I don't have the time. <laughs> <laughs> right, excellent. Uh, again. Thank you, everyone, for being a part of this. Uh, and viewers, again, I'll put the link in the description below. Um, take care, everyone. Um, be safe out there.